Stamey, and also I'd like to also welcome you, Mitch Easter. Uh, this is uh, Aaron at Power Popaholic, and um, I am so glad to talk to you about yesterday's tomorrow, which is the Winston Salem Sound, um, a celebration of this. Tell me a little bit about because when I listen to the album, it sounds like a group of uh, guys getting together who used to have bands in high school and then just having a jam. And it sounds a little bit like that, but really professional <laughs> musicians, uh, as opposed to high schoolers. Tell me a little bit about how the Winston-Salem Sound got started. Take it away, Chris. Uh, well, my memory of it is that it started with uh, um, a band called Captain Speed and the Funky Electric Mothers, um, who played a landmark show, a number of shows in uh, 1968 after uh, a musician named Bud Carlisle returned from uh, exploring San Francisco one summer and he brought back a strobe light and perhaps some illegal substances and put together a band that um, was exploring you know high volume feedback improvisation um, and particularly writing their own songs. Mm -hmm. And they and you basically they I never heard some of the bands that were listed in here. Were they all basically local, you know, 45s recorded and distributed through, you know, North Car Winston Salem, North Carolina? Well, a lot of this is sort of pre, you know, DIY recordings, you know. I mean, um, most of these bands were playing originally in, in high school, just imagining someday they would get to make records, but nobody knew how to do that, how to connect to that world, you know. Um, there were home tape recorders, and there's a surprisingly lot of that kind of action around here. But it really was the, I think the thing is, is that America, you know, rock music was kind of still novel when these bands were starting. It was still a thing. You, uh, you know, I could walk around a neighborhood and hear other bands rehearsing sometimes, which was really thrilling. And you played locally and maybe you met some new friends, you know, or something. And that's kind of it. But in the back of your mind was the dream of, you know, how to take this further. What's weird about it is that all the people around here kept playing, even if they didn't really ever put out records, everybody just about kept playing, which is why everybody on that show is pretty good. Um, yeah, that, I, I was, the proportion of people that kept playing is really high, which is odd. You know? Excellent. So um, how did the idea for the whole show for getting all these people together, uh, you know, which I don't know how long the gap was between when you spoke to these people last and now you know and what two years ago when it was recorded or so so um or three years ago um so tell me how that process started well i i felt like a a first time arsonist who burned down a city i mean all i had to do was uh put out the spark and everybody leapt into the blaze and uh i guess the spark in a way was that um i had written a, a book i called uh uh, a Spy in the House of Loud that I thought of as a book on songwriting, but it turned into more of a memoir um, with each chapter focusing on a particular song. And the first part of that book talked about, for example, the, uh, the Captain Speed record um, and, and our own early recordings. Um, and uh, so it, it made sense since it was music based to play the music one night. And I floated this idea and, um, you know, band, I mean, Sneakers, uh, Rittenhouse Square, um, uh, Sacred Irony, uh, The Imperturbable Teutonic Griffin. These bands, the musicians were all around or for the most part all around. We'd lost a few folks, uh, sadly. And um, there were cases where, uh, for example, uh, the, it wasn't possible for Captain Speed to play, who I was pretty fixated on, but um, we worked up their material. Um, the band had only made, they hadn't really made a record. What they'd done is had gone and recorded and they made, I think three or four copies, uh, you know, cutting a la each one is an individual lacquer. Right. So I, I guess you'd call that a pretty rare release. And uh, we played both sides of that, but, um, 
the ad hoc band was called the Love Valets, um, which had never existed back in the day. Yeah. Um, and it was named after the Love Valley Peace Festival. So it's kind of a little joke. And the other band, there was a band, Mitch and Robin Borthwick, who played drums, had a band called uh, the Loyal Opposition. Um, but since we didn't feel beholden to the grand old party at this point, um, we changed it to the Royal Opposition. The Royal Opposition. That's a little true. bit of our, our Brit rock. Is this how this is how sneakers sort of formed uh, in that in that same bubbling pot of creativity over there, right? At that same time. Well, related to the book, uh, we were trying to play stuff that happened before um, my the book shifted to New York. Sneakers was a bunch of Winston Salem guys who were living in Chapel Hill. It was a little later. I think uh, Imperturbable Teutonic Griffin and Sacred Irony, um, Arrogance um, was another band that would be at the heart of this period, which was, you know, 60, 1968 to maybe 73. Oh, great. Okay. So, and, you know, that is a long time ago. And I should add that, like, Robin Borthwick, who Chris just mentioned, was the first drummer that I was in a band with. And um, I mean, for any length of time that actually played out. And, um, I hadn't played with her since I was 13, I think. And then we had these rehearsals for this show and it was just like easy, you know? I mean, she's a great drummer. She's been playing all these years. She learned these songs incredibly. She's on a lot of the tracks that night. Um, but that's what's weird about this scene here. You know, these people uh, have not exactly stayed in touch, but they haven't not stayed in touch. And we were able just to play this stuff. And so that's why it really, it kind of wasn't a jam. It, the, all these songs were very sort of, I remember all of us were sort of writing pop songs back then, but or maybe we would call them rock songs back then, but, you know, it wasn't um, really loose, you know, we, in, in the back of our minds, we were going to make records with this stuff. But it is weird how easily everybody got together and played again, even across bands. It's like there was some sort of ancestral, you know, musical, dare I say, genetics that just made it real easy to do. Because when you hear the record, it really is not falling apart. You know, it's pretty good. You know, and it's, it yeah, was a one-off live show. It wasn't like this was the third night. Or you anything. know, some of it sounds really tight as far as you know the the way everyone sort of plays together. It's not. I'm like, wow. And was there any a lot of rehearsals or not? A little bit. There weren't a lot of rehearsals, but there. I mean, I mean, there were a certain amount. I would say at most three uh, yeah. for the different groups. But although Mitch played lead guitar in so many of these, just as he did back then. And um, so he did more rehearsals than anybody, but something, I mean, Robin, the drummer actually notated a lot of her parts. So she would be reading music. Um, uh, you know, I completely wrote out the, the, what the little orchestra did on uh, the song, that, uh, The Train Stops Here, right, uh, right. which was a big deal back in 72 or 73 when uh, Mitch played almost every instrument on it on our home recording. Um, so, you know, we all took it seriously and we did do a lot of, uh, there was some elbow grease involved, but I also think we got pretty lucky, you know. And some things, like the song by Bubble Puppy, um, I don't know if you know Bubble Puppy, they had a top 20 hit in probably 67 or 68 with Hot Smoke and Sassafras, and we were foolish enough to play that at the time, or maybe about 1970, we worked it up. And the, the fingers still found their homes, you know, with it, some it muscle sounds, memory involved. It sounds great. That track, that's the opening track. And, um, and it just, it sounds great. It, I didn't know of it before. It was new to me, for sure. And a lot of this, it, it felt like, you know, somebody listened to a whole bunch of nuggets, said, hey, let's, let's start playing some of these nuggets live on stage. And, and you pulled it off really well. Um, do you have a favorite song, each of you, a question for each of you, uh, Chris, you first. Do you have a favorite song on the LP? Do I have one favorite child? Um, I, I, I think I, I like Reptilian Disaster quite a bit, and I do like The Train Stops Here. Reptilian Disaster is just a blast, and um, The Train Stops Here is just uh, a shock that we pulled it off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that song is, you know, it was never played live. It was like a total creation for the basement tapes that Chris and I did in high school. 
and we were discovering how you could build songs. You know, you could overdub, you could pile stuff up. And once you start doing that, it's hard to stop until you become, <laughs> you know, exhausted or something. And especially it, it's weird that track exists because I don't even know how it was done. You know, it's got a lot of stuff on it. Um, so anyway, that was the world debut of it. And besides it being in our basement and, um, and we got through it. And uh, if you listen to that song, there's a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, it's pretty busy. Uh, what's your what's your favorite song on the album? Do you have a favorite track? No, I, I, I'm I'm officially out of the favorites business. I was never any good at that. <laughs> I'm just not any good at it. If I say something, it's just random, you know. And then I'll feel like I left out the thing I really like, you know. And I just don't have a favorite. It, it, well, you, know, you, I, you love all your kids equally. I know. <laughs> yeah, you know, and and some of the kids turned out better than you expected. You know, the ones that you thought were just gonna be, you know, slackers turned out to be, you know. Um, you know, inventors, you know. I, I, anyway, yeah, there's some surprise good ones on there, but I, no, I, I just couldn't tell you. Maybe. Okay, great. Um, a question I have, um, I guess, also for Chris, uh, you've done a variety of projects over the past, you know, I'd say five, uh, six years, all over the place, all over the map, as far as, you know, genre. Uh, you've done, you know, the classic American songbook, you've done jazz, you've gone back with uh, Peter Holsapple on a few uh, really great uh, collaborations with Mavericks and then, you know, two other albums after that. I mean, what's, uh, what's next on your plate? Well, um, to answer your question in kind of a roundabout way, I, I think one thing that when you started playing in, uh, you know, 68, 69, and that kind of time period, there was a feeling of um, finding a way to make music of to to evolve to right. try if you uh learn one chord you might write one song with that b7 in it but the next time you're going to write a song with a diminished chord in it you're going to try to expand and go beyond and um it wasn't really technology based as much then although it was just certainly exciting to say own a fuzz box which was a new invention at the time right um, but that idea of uh, going further or going beyond has always been something that I think everybody in Winston was drawn to, and and I uh, find it very dear. And um, they've, I'm not saying I've always done that in my life, but I've been interested in writing uh, songs based around um, chords that have four notes or five notes. Uh, I, a, a thicker palette, and that also has to do with writing more on a piano, um, because on a guitar, basically you can hold down five notes at the same time, or maybe spread your thumb around. Right. On a piano, you can, you know, you've got all ten happening, and you can get a little denser voicing. So, when you talk about um, a fascination with jazz, I mean, it's not any different. I mean, Mingus Alm is a huge record for me, but. All the Mingus recordings were huge for me in the 60s. I just couldn't play them. Um, so that's kind of wiggling around your question, I guess. <laughs> I think um, all, all musicians tend to have a Catholic appreciation of music, and, and um, I'm no different than most. Yeah, right. no, that's cool. Um, I guess one of my last questions here and for you, Chris, is um, it's obviously been a long time again since we've heard anything from the DBs. Um, what are the DBs up to? Uh, well, I mean, I, I left the band in uh, 82 or 83. I really, really have to check in with Peter more on that. <laughs> but um, th there is a, a, a record that uh, Will, Peter, Jean, and I have worked on uh, for release this fall um, uh, called uh, I Thought You Wanted to Know. And it's, a, it's kind of the record that was before the first Stevie's record. In a way, it's a prequel record. It's got, it's a double album vinyl. Uh, there are live tracks on it. I think uh, Time Has Come Today by the Chambers Brothers. Uh, I don't know. Tomorrow Never Knows for the Beatles. Uh, but then um, there are also some, there's a song called My Sai Wristwatch, uh, going to the club that nobody knows at all, really. Um, but there are also these 
a, a lot of this has to do with the incredible invention of the uh, four track tape recorder, the reel to reel tape recorder back in, come on Kitty. Um, that's a classic trope, isn't it? Sorry about that. Um, uh, back in uh, the, the affordable uh, TAC four track tape recorder, this is a reel to reel machine that Mitch and I started recording on. And I carried that up to New York when the DBs were playing and we camped out at the offices of New York Rocker Magazine. Come on, Kitty. And uh, did a bunch of recording, the DBs did. And that's was really quite good. Um, our, in some cases, arguably perhaps better than what came out. So we're excited about that coming out. Wow, that's great news. I love to hear it. I cannot wait. <laughs> to hear I, that music. Could be September or October. I, I don't really know. I'm not on the front lines of that. All right. It should great. be a nice release. Excellent. Excellent. Great care. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining us. Chris Stamey and Mitch Easter, thank you so much. Be sure to pick up Yesterday's Tomorrow, this live album. Um, it's got some terrific music on it. All the performances are great. I, I mean, I Oh, and a booklet. Yeah. Look, yeah. look at and and it's got the a, it's got the history of... of uh, yeah, there you go. Mine, yeah, it's got the history. 24 of pages. Yeah, so many bands there that I've never heard of. Tiny writing. Hmm, okay, great. That's awesome. Thank you so much for this interview. I really appreciate it. And um, we'll be looking out for your new material uh, as it comes out, both of you. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. So long. <laughs>